So let me introduce Kent Blancet. Kent is the lead systems architect for BP's high performance computing team. He's going to talk about the deployment of a new cluster with water cooling. So I'm Kent Blancet. Uh, this was also done in coordination with uh, Gary Kuzma with HOK Architects. Uh, they also do the mechanical and electrical design work for our building and they've been very helpful throughout our, our whole existence. Uh, a lot of this work began about nine years ago when we started building our building. Uh, we knew at that time that we would want um, to have the opportunity to do water-cooled systems because they're more efficient. Uh, they can also provide a lot more density and uh, and we tried to build that flexibility into the building when we designed it. So we're going to talk about some of the initial design parameters and uh, considerations that we've put into the building and then the well, how we implemented the system and what the results have been. So when we designed the building, we just wanted to be able to handle about uh, 15 megawatts of total electric load uh, with a, a good PUE rating of 1.32, 1.35. We actually achieved 1.32 very early in our existence. Uh, we wanted to have plenty of capacity to grow and be scalable. Uh, the initial design criteria was 35 kilowatts a rack uh, that we could cool with air and we wanted to have just regular uh, regular protection for the computing systems and use hot oil containment to do that. Um, the infrastructure in the building was put in all at once. Uh, there were some large pieces of equipment, some of the extra chillers that we did not put in initially because we did not have the load to require those. We put in space and all the piping to be ready to do that if we needed. Um, then for the actual compute area, uh, it's set up with piping and valves already in place so we can add water cooling as we need to. We started off all air cooled and Initially, we used about just over half of the white space for the servers, and that was all, all air-cooled at the time. We had racks that ranged from 23 kilowatts a rack, and more recently, we put in Skylake racks that were about 32 or 34 kilowatts a rack, and that's about all we can cool with air. Um, It's very traditional, you know, you route your, the air gets cooled by the crack units, it, it flows up through the compute nodes, up through the hot aisle, and through a plenum back to the crack units. So what we had to do, we had to consider a lot of things, and this is where we brought Gary Kuzma back in to discuss all these different items that he has to think about in order to make sure we were going to be able to handle water cooling with the systems that we were trying to build and just understand what the limits were. And uh, we ended up going with water cooling. We chose a cool IT solution uh, that was provided through HP. The This is a picture of their cooling distribution unit. It is much more efficient space-wise and uses less electricity to power the whole or to cool the whole system than air. The one thing up here that might be a little questionable is lower, uh, lower initial cost. That's if we had not put air cooling in the building already. So this was an additional piece of hardware we had to buy. If you were going straight to 
air, uh, water cooling, it would be cheaper overall than a bunch of crack units. The, there are lower operating costs than air cooling, and it's a lot more efficient. How much more efficient is it? Well, a pound of chilled water can handle four times more cooling than one pound of air. So, uh, and then a cubic foot of chilled water does a thousand X more cooling than a cubic foot of air. So that's the kind of benefit that we were trying to get at. And then the final is one ton of cooling uh, requires seven times more energy to move around than one ton of cooling using water. So what are some of the problems that you run into or that you worry about? Obviously leaks and condensation because you've got water going different places in your computer room and in the cold areas. So you've got to deal with those. Before we implemented this, we checked with a couple other people that had implemented similar solutions because we didn't want to be the first ones to find the leaks under our server room floor. Uh, TAC has a very large installation and we found that they had one leak and they could uh, explain why and it turned out not to be a huge problem. Uh, another organization, Ohio Supercomputing Center, had used a similar technology and we have dealt with them before and they were very pleased with their installation. So we did our due diligence as much as we could and went forward. This is kind of hard to see, but we have uh, chilled water lines coming through our computer room and then we had the valving already put in place when we built the building. So we were able to tap onto those and turn it on without any downtime to the building. So everything else stayed up while we did all this. We, uh, this is just another way of presenting that. So we found that we had to just talk through a lot of these options and issues that we were concerned about with all the different vendors involved. With this, you know, with most installations, you have to talk with vendors. Now with water cooling involved, you've got to talk with even more vendors, including your building engineer. That's very important to understand the limitations of the building, what different options he can handle, he or she, uh, because uh, some of them, like uh, our building, you have an option with the cooling distribution units to either have a three-way valve or a two-way valve, and that determines whether you're going to be sending, uh, whether you're going to vary your volume of liquid coming back to the system or if you're going to vary the temperature coming back. And some systems are designed to handle one versus the other. So we dealt with HOK, Cool IT, ABM, and the mechanical installers. Those were all new. We had already dealt many times with HPE, PCPC Direct, and Melton Electric for any kind of power installation issues. So we found that we've essentially had to create uh, 3D easements for all the different uh, services that we have because everything in our center is under the floor. So you've got power, you've got uh, now water, you've got the network, and you have to lay out areas for all those to pass without conflicting with each other. And you even have to uh, set out easements between the primary and cooling because if they don't talk, uh, we had a situation where we almost had a conflict where the primary cooling install installers were going to conflict with the secondary. So you just have to be careful. What we ended up choosing was a Cascade Lake AP cluster with 720 nodes and that's done in 12 racks. Each node is 384 gig of memory, 25 gig ethernet for storage, and an HDR100 for MPI type traffic. This round we decided to go with two terabytes of NVMe flash 
for local scratch data. The cooling infrastructure is two of the cool IT CDU units. Each of those is capable of handling 720 kilowatts. And each of these 12 racks is 62 kilowatts. So it's, it's right at 720 kilowatts total power. Uh, we've estimated that the heat removed by the system is about 75 to 80% of what is created because the cool IT puts a cold plate on the CPUs and cold plates around the DIMMs. The CPUs in the Cascade Lake APs are 350 watts each, two sockets at 700 watts, and then 24 DIMMs at, at about 10 watts each. So that's another 240. Each node is just over a kilowatt. So that's, that's very similar to what you'd find in some of the GPU nodes that different places are using. Uh, we're also using 415 volt, three phase inputs, 60 amp. So those are pretty big cables. So this is a picture of while they were installing the Cool IT piping. It's, a, it's almost a PVC pipe. It's a little heavier duty than that. And they melt the pieces of it and uh, squeeze them together to fuse them all. So one chilled water supply and one return, and they go at different levels under the floor, and then they tap off to each of the, the racks. Uh, the PCPC Direct did the integration of the racks off-site. And one thing they normally do for other installations is they power on systems and make sure they're running and we don't have too many failures. They were not able to do that because they don't have uh, water cooling at their facility. So we had to have them integrate the racks and bring them on site and power them up on site for the first time. And we had very few failures, which was a pleasant surprise. We first received these racks and all the infrastructure uh, pretty much the week of supercomputing when everybody was out, except for one guy, Mike Smalley, who had to deal with all that. Um, after we got back from supercomputing and after the holidays, the vendors came in and started assembling everything on site. Um, we started powering things up about December 1st and went through some tuning phases with the CDUs, getting things balanced, getting all the air out of the lines, uh, doing testing at full power, half power, idle load, uh, just to make sure we had things working. And then December 17th, we turned the whole system over to our first major user to start a large project. Uh, this is a special user that uh, has a pro process that requires, it's just single node jobs to start with. And so that's a very good jo type job for burn in testing. And they have been running since, since December 17th and they're expected to finish up at the end of March. So that's a pretty large job. Uh, we believe that we've seen better performance uh, as far as stability uh, than with our air-cooled systems. So that is nice. That will be especially nice with MPI jobs since they are frequently gated by the slowest performing machine. And we think this will be a, a big improvement. Uh, we do have some, Keith, spent some money and put some glass tiles on the floor so we can actually show the piping under the floor. Uh, it gives some ideas. You know, otherwise you go in a, a server room and you see some racks. And we also put uh, clear panels on the back of the CDUs so you can see all the piping that's involved there. Here's some of the underfloor 
And yes, we do have power underneath all the water, so we don't want leaks. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it is encased in uh, conduit and there is leak protection. We have not had any leaks so far. Uh, and we don't, <laughs> we don't want any. Uh, so this is looking down one of the rows. This is half of the cluster. So you've got the CDU here, and then you've got six racks of nodes. It, it looks like a bunch of server racks. One thing we have noticed, uh, there is you know, 20, 25% of the heat load that is dissipated through the air, but the fan noise and the ability to walk behind the racks and uh, still have a conversation and not be uh, inundated with heat is a big improvement. So uh, based on our experience, I think we've decided that all future clusters of any significant size will probably be liquid cooled. Uh, it may not be this exact technology as those may change over time, but it will be something water-cooled. Uh, once we have all these clusters water-cooled, we will be able to raise the temperature of the chilled water loops and maybe even turn off some of our chillers, which will be a significant cost savings. So that's one of the things we're trying to do is get to a point that all our systems are liquid-cooled, we can turn off the chillers and run essentially off free cooling. Uh, so that's, that is our goal. So that's me and Gary, and he has all kinds of letters after his name, so. <clears throat> Hey, great talk, Kent. Um, I applaud your efforts to get as low a PUE as possible. I'm just curious, what are your opinions on immersion cooling as opposed to just water cooling? I would not be very happy with immersion cooling with the baby oil type solutions. There are some very expensive ones that are two phase or phase change cooling that might be more acceptable, but you still have to deal with some of the issues of uh, thermal grease and uh, fans and things like that that you'd have to deal with. But it's not worth the effort. I think it'd be tough to deal with. Yeah. Hey, Kent, great talk. Um, what sort of improvements did y'all make to your underfloor leak detection systems as part of this, if any? Uh, I wouldn't say we made any improvements. We just extended it and made sure it's covering a little more of the area than we might have done in the past. So, um, have you noticed any change in your air cooled racks now that you put all the piping under the floor and the airflow? Does it disrupt the airflow or anything? Uh, no, these are in separate areas. Okay. It's, it's kind of in a an extension area at this point and as we change out clusters we will go back and pull out a cluster of air cooled systems and retrofit and put the air water cooled stuff under there it's yeah four inches hey Ken thanks for the talk um, Please accept my sympathy if you ever have to put pink dye in the system to find a leak. <laughs> I would avoid it. Um, it are you, it's green and it shows up with UV light. Okay. Are you doing, you said 400 volt to the racks? Yes. Do you have any additional safety precautions that you have to deal with on people being around that voltage? No. Uh, they're all pin and sleeve connectors. Uh, we've not had any concerns raised we did check that uh, we are most of our other racks are actually 480 volt uh, we have found that that's too difficult to get from vendors so we're putting 415 in and that is doable 
by everybody. Okay, thanks. So we heard a good uh, presentation yesterday from uh, Ron Cogswell from Shell on the, the, the benchmarking that they're doing. I was wondering what uh, the decision, oh, I'll introduce myself first to Tiffany Trader, HPC Wire. Uh, wondering what the decision making was that went into choosing the Cascade Lake APs and um, what kind of benchmarking you did and then maybe just a super quick follow up question too. Our developers were involved in a lot of that, looking at our specific applications we are heavily bound by memory bandwidth, and the Cascade Lake APs gives you, tw you know, twice the cores and twice the memory bandwidth. And just so, what's your what's your sense of the state of adoption of liquid cooling within your your industry? Um, well, we're doing this sort of liquid cooling down under Geo Solutions of Geosciences. They're doing immersive cooling. CGG, I think, does some immersive cooling. Many of our competitors are at Cyrus One and they don't do, they may have trouble getting liquid cooling unless they stand up and say, you must provide this. 